Welcome to Camden County College. I am a Senator Fred Madden. I'm a Senator over the 4th Legislative District. We are in Boston Township. That is one of the towns in the 4th District. With us this evening is Senate President Stephen Sweeney, uh, hometown of West Deptford over in Gloucester County. He's been our Senate President now. He's in his third year in the Senate. As a uh, Senate body, we elect our own leader, and by uh, voice vote, Senator Sweeney was about to lead the Senate in last session and in this current two-year session. I appreciate you coming out to hear firsthand from the Senator himself about the initiative on the property tax reduction plans from the uh, caucus in our Democratic Party and through in the State Senate that we're trying to negotiate together with the Republican Party and work in, uh, in unison the best that we can. To uh, Senator Beach from uh, Camden County will be arriving shortly. And for all those who have taken the time to come out, uh, this has been a, uh, an opportunity for strictly the Senate President to take uh, the plan, his plan, to the people to field questions. And by way of protocol, the Senate President will just briefly uh, talk to you about the initiatives. Uh, there's been two things, that, two, op two plans put before the people that are being kicked around in the State House right now and discussed. And after the President's done, we just open it up. It's a wide open forum for questions and uh, that's generally been pretty successful, and I think most people who have left have had their questions answered. And uh, we look for a, a real good exchange this evening. It's open, and basically your meeting with an opportunity to uh, interact with an individual you rarely get a chance to see. So at this point, uh, strong advocate for uh, largely working class people, and for those who want to know Steve's uh, starting point uh, in politics, it had to do with the. Uh, the less fortunate and developmentally disabled children. That's really what uh, made Stephen step forward, raise his hand, and ran for office as a freeholder in Gloucester County back in the 90s to try to make a difference for people who were inflicted with developmental disabilities and the challenges of those families. And as a result of that, his uh, interest in trying to help people across the spectrum by the middle class and uh, working families has just continued to grow. Well, as I say, now he serves as the Senate President, large, uh, large speaking you know, voice, if you will, for working families. One of my closest friends, Senate President Steve Spoon. We, uh, we decided to start going on the road talking about tax plans, property tax cuts that we were proposing. Because the governor decided to start running a whole bunch of commercials saying, I agree with him. Well, you know, we've agreed when he's right, but I don't agree with giving the wealthy another tax cut. This is an income tax plan that saves 95% of the money goes to the wealthy. My plan, the Senate plan, all the money goes to the middle class. It's capped at $250,000. So understand, we're going to take $1.4 billion and put it into the into the economy, the local economy, where people making two hundred fifty thousand dollars or less or less will benefit from all the savings. The governors, unfortunately, you know, when the governor got elected, he gave millionaires a tax cut of forty thousand dollars when everyone's taxes went up. Property taxes have gone up twenty percent on average around the state, and you know. Property taxes are the problem, not income tax. So this wasn't really, and I've told people this, this isn't really complicated, it's not really sexy, it's pretty simple. Again, the money's going, lowering it from unlimited to a cap of $250,000. We're using your property tax bill as the basis, because there's charts if you make $50,000 on average, your average property tax bill is X. So what we're focusing on is making sure that all the people in the middle get this. And you know, the difference is if you put it in the hands of people that actually need it, they spend it. And that means a tax cut gets back into the economy, which helps create jobs. You know, there's been a lot of discussions about giving wealthy people tax cuts. And what normally happens 
is it goes in the bank. Because, you know, they're living okay. They don't need it. Give those tax cuts to the middle class and they'll actually go out and spend it. And that's when tax cuts actually work. So we provided charts here basically to show towns what, if you live in these towns, what you would get at the end of this. Because again, we live in zip codes where there's not many people making more than $250,000. So that's what we were trying to do, is find a way to help the middle class over the wealthy. And everyone says it's class warfare. It's not class warfare. Understand when the governor came into office, people making more than $1,000, I mean more than a million dollars, got a $40,000 a year tax cut. That's what they got. Everyone else's property taxes went up 20% because he cut rebate programs, he's cut funding for schools, he's cut municipal aid. So I've agreed with the governor on one thing. There's extra money. I've agreed with him that there's extra funding. I'm taking his numbers. I'm not doing what he's doing. I'm not inflating the growth. He inflates our revenue growth at over seven and a quarter percent. Ours are around 5%, so ours are realistic and these are real numbers. And at least we can get the money into the hands of the people that need it the most. And that's what the whole debate has been. We don't agree with him in giving income tax cuts because the income tax, the income tax is not the issue in the state. I don't know how many people in the state think it's the income tax that's the problem, it's more property taxes. Look, this isn't the perfect solution. There's more work to be done. But when you have the ability to help some people, this is the fastest way to do it, and it's the easiest way to do it. So again, we've come up with a plan that's much different than the governor's. And um, I'll look at Woolwich Township. Under our plan, a person winds up on average $890. Under the governor's plan, 296 Washington Township, under the governor's plan, 181 Under ours, 661 Significant difference. And the money's getting in the hands of the people that need the most. So and that's it. That's the difference. So understand, we do not agree. When you hear these commercials where the governor says, the Senate president and I agree, we don't. This is based on income taxes where all the money's lion's share of the money goes to the wealthy. Ours is based on property taxes where all the money goes to people under $250,000. So I mean, it's that simple. But doing these meetings, we also wanted to talk to people with what's ever on their mind. You know, the, you know, the governor will have a tendency to talk for 45 minutes and take a couple questions. I would rather listen to what you have to say and answer any questions that you have to have. But we were trying to roll out, and we'd love for everyone to take a look at these charts to get an understanding of what we're looking at, rather than what the governor's been talking about, which is completely different than what we're looking at. So, I mean, it's that simple. I wish it was uh, more creative, and, but we wanted to make it easy enough for people to understand. You know, this is what I make, this is what my property taxes are on average, and this is what I get off. So that's what this, this, that's what this equates to. So with that, again, uh, I'd rather listen to you, hear your questions, and try to give you the answers the best I can. Uh, the last one, the last meeting we had was very lively, and I appreciated the honesty from the public, and again, you get an honest answer back. If I don't have one, I'll get you one. But I'd rather open it up to questions now. Okay, I want to ask any questions. Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good evening. What year um, uh, income are you using to do? And what are you making with the uh, percentage? I'm sorry, sorry, I didn't hear you. What year is income are you using to make? This year. Yes. It starts this year and phases it over four years. Property taxes in the state are 
You know, the people that are leaving New Jersey now are our seniors, our parents, our grandparents, because they're the ones on the fixed income. You know, the governor cites a study about $70 billion in wealth that's left New Jersey since 2004, and he's right. But they're not the rich people, they're senior citizens. They're people that, like my iron workers, that when they retire, they can't afford to live here. You know, and what you're dealing with is, you know, you, you, you struggle so much. The difference is, I, I go to a union hall in the morning, and I watch guys at 5.30 in the morning, hoping to find a job that have lost their health benefits, that have lost their, you know, that, that they're not getting any pension credits, and not, you know, they're, they're losing their homes, they're just barely making it. There's a difference when you've been in that situation. I'm probably one of the few legislators that collect unemployment from it. So I understand what it's like when you don't have the resources. And when you go to a grocery store, you have to pay for your groceries with your credit card. And how humiliating that is, because you're struggling because you know you can't provide for your family. And you know that what you're doing is just a short-term fix. And you know, this is going to be a long-term problem. Every three months, Jimmy and I, our social security check goes to our company. We can't fly this <laughs> Well, And it's, uh, I'm, I, I'm near 70, but I continue to work because I don't want to work. Right now. I understand why you work, but so, it's, it's not fair. It's, it's right. And he keeps saying, let's get out of here. Let's get out of New Jersey. So it's, uh, we're getting ready to the state. What are talking about? Well, that's why the government talks about income tax. That's not the tax problem. Not. The problem you have here is property taxes. And whenever you can do something to reduce property taxes, that should be our focus. And again, there's more, more needs to be done. But I'm just taking advantage of the dollars that the governors have said, these dollars are available. So we're going to agree with them. We'll take those dollars and apply them all to the property tax issue. So again, you know, you'll, some people will get up to thousand dollars from this program. This doesn't affect the other programs either. This I is separate. Yeah. So it's saying income tax. So when you file your income tax return, you'll get a credit. You'll get a credit. Yes. Yeah. That's not good.
I just can't get nobody to help us. Well, listen, I, I, I have people here who try to help us. I can't guarantee I mean, it's for my wife. She's working now and driving a bus because she has no money. Well, they worked all them years to help Kate May put a 35 job down here. That's what they did. I told her how to do it, but she wouldn't do it my way. And you know what my way is. I'm a street guy, I understand. Well, I know, but sometimes you can't be straight. I know, I said street. Yeah. <laughs> There's a difference, you know. But anyway, I, I got it off my chest. Well, I have people here. And like I say, I mean, I really feel bad for my wife and my brother. And I, I appreciate you listening to me. Yeah, plus I have people here. I'd be happy to see how we can try to help or at least get into it. And they even got $3 million in the paper from Lo Beyondo. He got them in grants for $3 million. And then we're, I called him on the phone. I said, why don't you get my, my his father knew my father was real good. And he wouldn't get, they couldn't even well, take care of say, it. Kevin's here, he'll give you his card and we'll try to help you out. But I appreciate you letting me talk. No, not at all. No problem. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, thanks. Yes. Second, there's a motion. I'm glad you're pushing back. But before I go too far, uh, I just got one question about what doing this what once did because this isn't the only thing going on. Uh, Governor Christie and the Education Commissioner proposed some funding changes as part of their budget proposal. And I think the devil's in the details. The way they describe it is an increase. But, it, but it's all depending on what you use as your baseline. And if you use the law that you guys voted in three or four years ago, it's actually a seven hundred million plus decrease compared to what SFRA really requires over the four years from 2010 through 2013, it's a 3.6 billion dollar underfunding, which incorporates the amount of money he took back in 2010 and what the cuts were in 2011, and the little bit that he's given back over the last couple of years plus what's in the budget as an increase. I'll say that loosely for next year. Okay, so if you're able to do this, what funding recommendation are you going to make? for schools, and I'd like to hear you say you're going to push back completely and treat the law as a law, not as a goal that you might get to someday, okay? And, and how far are you going to be able to get with that? And given that your funding, excuse me, your revenue recommendations are realistic, and I, I understand what your point on what the governor's projections are based on, but to the extent that you, you may also have trouble meeting what your projections are, what what would your priorities be and how would you handle those cuts if they were required? Well, what we did last year, so you know, we were able, we came up with a way to fully fund the school funding for them. Back, I think it was 06, 06, we asked to actually pass the school funding formula. It was the first time in 30, 40 years that they designated that we came up with the funding formula that was fair. And it actually ended the acts so-called right. ads. They were over. Which, you know, everyone complains about certain school districts getting all the money. But the courts told us, you have to fund this formula. And Governor Corzani, 20% one year, I think it was five or so the maximum. This governor came in, running on a commitment that he wouldn't cut school funding, wouldn't cut municipal aid. Well, there's a big hole. I know that, and I'm not worried about it. And then he cut school funding and municipal aid and forced the lawsuit. Right. He forced the lawsuit where money got redirected, five hundred million dollars more got redirected to the school districts that he complains about all the time. If he had fully funded if he had funded the school districts the way he should have, we wouldn't have that problem. So what we said, look. Again, he argues that it's not fair to tax millionaires. That's his issue. We feel when you reduce the earning tax credit, you tax the poor. Middle classes taxes have gone up 20%. Your property taxes have gone up 20% because of the cuts that he gave. Now, we had a way to fund this, and it was a millionaire's tax. And realize, he gave them a tax cut when he came in office. Right. So it's not an increase, it's what they were paying before. But his argument was, you know, these are people that are small, medium-sized businesses. That was his argument in the beginning. Again, I agree. 63,000 people, and it was people down, down to $400,000. So we agree with you. We're making a true millionaire's tax. 
you won't pay one dollar more until you go over a million dollars. Right? Seems fair. First million is not being touched. I don't think I hit anybody in this room with that. <laughs> I wish I did, but I don't think I did. And, and that's how we would come up with $660 million to fund schools. And he vetoed it. And he's going to continue to veto it. And he's going to use fuzzy math to say, increase school funding. We'll go to school boards and ask the school board presidents or the school districts if funding has been increased. Exactly. But it decreased. Look, he took 5%, gave back one, and said, look, I gave you your money back. You know, it's, it's insulting what he's done with the numbers. So, no, we're not going to give up on a school funding formula that we know, number one, is constitutional. We just got to start funding it. And we're going to continue to push to try to fund it because, you know, someone said it with this money. Well, it could go for paying the pensions. It could go for school funding. It could go for paying the roads. It could go for paying this and paying that and paying this. One thing where I do agree with them, if you give government money, they spend it. You know, I'm serious, because there's so many worthy programs, there's so many needs, and honestly, the people that are paying the bills can't afford it anymore. So, we've identified this money to go to, pro uh, to property tax relief, but we still have to work on funding our schools, and that's going to be a priority for us. And we know we have a formula, and we know we have a way to fund it. So, again, we're going to continue to push for those things, because they need to be funded. Understand, the pension, we fix the pension, whether, whether people want to agree or not, Pensions are long-term issues. You know, it's a long-term look when you look at a pension, you gotta look at 30 years. It's like anybody has a retirement investment. You don't look at just today, you gotta look out and project out. Well, we knew that the pensions were in trouble. We knew the pensions were in trouble. And we fixed it, we fixed it the way you would in my world, which is by, by setting it, making decisions, and making tough decisions to do it. But we're gonna keep focusing on finding ways to fund education. Because education will drive your property taxes. So again, we're going to be, we'll stay focused on that. Yes. Can I take from your response that you would consider that it was constitutional requirement to fund the suburban schools as well as the added schools? Absolutely. And if you take from my comment when we did the school funding formula in 2006, we did that. Yeah. And it was working well, the first year, a lot of districts got 20%, 10%. The suburban districts were extremely happy. My legislative district has the fastest growing school district in the state, Woolwich. You want to talk about a nightmare, having hundreds more kids in the school district without any money. You know, so you know, we're very focused on that. Very focused. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. Do you agree that Governor Christie gave the bridge a uh, $40,000 tax credit? And also that the you and the legislature wanted to have a millionaire's tax. How did Governor Christie give the legislature, I mean the uh, the bridge, a forty thousand dollar tax cut unilateral without you guys? Because we gave him a bill. We gave him a bill that he vetoed twice. No, 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 not your fault. I understand that point. You guys came with this with this millionaire tax. He said no. That's his job. You guys make the law. He agrees to it and enforces it. How did he? Right, you said. Governor Christie gave the rich a forty thousand dollars tax credit. How did he do that without you guys? Because he refused to put the sign the bill he gave. That's how we gave okay, him the bill. The, the, we gave him a bill. You guys had a part in that. The legislature had to We gave him a bill. Right. Yes. Our part was giving him a bill that would be fair to everyone in this room. Okay. And he vetoed the bill not once but twice. That's the millionaire tax. Yes. Of I'm course. not talking about that. I'm talking about you you said how did yeah, no, Governor Christie gave the rich a forty thousand dollar tax cut because we had to redo it, and he chose not to redo it. It was on the books. He chose not to re up it. It was on the books, and he chose not to re up the tax, the millionaire's tax. And we agreed with him when he said the original tax was on people making four hundred thousand dollars and up. So in other words. So in other words so in other words, the forty thousand dollar tax cut that Governor Christie gave to the rich when he came in was something that, in other words, had a drop dead date on it. Yeah, yeah, sunset. Okay, the sunset. And he refused to reopen. So he, he refused. To, okay, so then it was his decision not to. Do that. Yes. Okay. All right. Yes. Okay. Program that has 
nothing to do with the millionaire's tax. Am I correct in that? In other words, this money is not reliant on a millionaire's tax uh, going forward. So you're, this money is already there. Is, is that correct? If this is taking his numbers, not putting a millionaire's tax in it because he said he won't sign a bill with a millionaire's tax. And people need to get relief now. And we have the ability to provide that relief. Realize his income tax plan gives it to people no limits. It's based on income tax. And understand, someone making 50000 winds up with $81. Someone making a million winds up with $7,200. So the money's going to places where it doesn't really, where it's really not needed. And I don't begrudge people that are wealthy. God bless people that are successful. You know what I mean? You know, some, some of it's by luck, some of it's by hard work. But you know, when you do tax cuts, the problem with tax cuts are they, they're not given to the people that will spend it. So our focus is putting it into the middle class because you'll actually spend it because you don't have a whole lot of disposable income laying around. So you're going to take that money and you're going to actually go you know, fix something, buy, buy a refrigerator, you're going to go spend it because you need it. And that gets back to the economy where, again, you get someone that's making over a million dollars, they're going to get $7,200 on them, they're living okay. They're going to put it in the bank. So you don't get the benefit of the tax cut. So this is no millionaire's tax. It's taking his numbers, except being more conservative about the growth of revenues. His growth revenues are over 7%, which really are unrealistic. And we want to be conservative so we can Yes, sir. Now, the townships or the counties are not going to be able to raise your taxes because they're, you're going to give a 10% cut. This because right going now, if you appeal your taxes, that's what they're talking about, rebuilding the whole multiplication system on how they're going to raise your taxes, even though you're going to appeal on it now, since your houses aren't worth the same. I'm sorry. If, if we're talking about property taxes and your income. Right, exactly. Not, not, not your well, your assessments will attack property taxes. Whatever your, whatever your property taxes are, it's 10% of that. So whatever that's going to wind up being. So it's, it's still going to come back in our pocket. There's no way that they're going to no, be able to raise no, anything. Listen, else. someone said to me, well, why don't you just do it the towns? And the towns will take care of it. And I said, absolutely not. Right. <laughs> because I run, I'm telling you, I ran government for years. And you give it to them. They're going to spend it. And listen, it's not because they're mean spirited. There's a lot of needs. Government has a whole lot of needs. And you know, resources are tough. This governor cut me this way. And then we put a cap in. You know what I mean? So we made it tough. And you know, the governor introduced a two and a half percent cap, and I introduced one at two. Because I wanted it to be even tighter. Because you know, we got to get to a point where we do something about the growth of property taxes. You know, it's it's not. Look at people that are like we were just talking earlier about. I might have to leave New Jersey. That's not fair. Not after you raised your family and your kids are here. That's not fair. So we got to do more and we got to do a better job. Look, I got a bill that does shared services. And, you know, it's got a lot of discussion going on right now. Worcester County, when I was the freeway director there, we saved the towns $30 million a year which is an average of 18 cents on your tax rate, which is hundreds of dollars on your tax rate. And guess what? Everything gets picked up, the trash gets picked up, 911 answers, you know, so services are there. So look, we got to reform government. Then we got to find a way to fund our government services better than property taxes. But we got to get the real cost of government first. And yes, sir, don't move right. Yes, Senator Sweet. Uh, not to belabor this point to go back to history at the beginning of the question, but to put it very simply, if under Corzine I got a $1,200 rebate, and then the first year that Christie was in I got zero, and then the second year that he was in I got a minuscule type of payment in, a, in one of the quarters of my tax payment. And then as we get into the next period of time, it goes up slightly, okay. Not even reaching a quarter of what that $1,200 is. I understand your philosophy. With this, I don't get my $1,200 back. If I lived in the Barrington area, what would I get? 
just just for a sake, Barrington had night seven hundred and two dollars. Seven hundred and two dollars versus twelve hundred. So in other words But his plan's one hundred and twenty eight. Right. Okay. I think from what we just discussed from this history viewpoint, the next time that any one of the senators or assembly people are on New Jersey television, the Fugazi New Jersey television, not the real one. The next time they're on there, I think I have to go back into history and talk to some taxpayers on the history of Christie. Because when he comes out, he says, state, oh, well, I'm, I've increased the amount of money that I'm giving you back. Yeah, you're giving me what, $76? The second year, and you're basing it on 2000 and whatever when my grandchild wasn't even born. Yeah, he has to be taken to task. And when he begins to puff and huff and puff, then give it right back in his face with facts. Because he's not going to be able to hold up the facts because he's done zero since he's been in office. So bring the facts up to him, and we'll live with a modest proposal like this. Maybe we'll be satisfied with that amount of money, but remember, we want the 1200 back because that's the only way it's going to build. Yeah. And the last question, I don't want to be too long with it. When he vetoes bills, how many votes are needed in ballpark figure to override his veto? In our house, it's three. Good. And unfortunately, we can't get one. Right. Look, and someone says, well, why don't you negotiate with uh, It's 27. Right. We have 24 Democrats, we need three Republicans. So the next election, we need to vote for more Democrats well, to we'll override it. And I, want to, I just want to recognize the assembly with Troy Singleton who came in. Thanks for being here, Troy. Uh, yes, ma'am, this one, this one, and over the road. Well, I have a problem because I am a New Jersey resident. My plan is to leave New Jersey because I can't afford my taxes. I've owned a house in Cherry Hill for 23 years. My husband's a state employee for 24 years. Uh, his pension was stopped being funded by the state when Governor Whitman was here. So I'm going to catch 22. Yes, I want my property taxes to go down, but I'd also like you to own up to what his job, when he got, took his job 24 years ago and has worked for the state of New Jersey, and most people probably don't know this, but you can go on the website and see what these people make. They don't make a huge amount of money, but their deal was when they got the jobs for the state that they'd have benefits, that they'd have a retirement. Now, the state of New Jersey, you politicians have decided that you haven't funded it since Governor Whitman, and now Christie's staying another seven years, my husband's going to be retired by then. How is that fair that he's put in 24 years of hard labor, making less than the people out in the public, and he also was promised that he'd get his sick pay. He has nine months of sick pay stored up because he didn't take sick time. I mean, they called us on our honeymoon because they were having problems with his, you know, they needed his assistance. And I just think it's so unfair because now they're saying, oh, we're gonna cap that too. We're not giving that benefit. And so every time we turn around as New Jersey residents, and also I understand there's also now a bill that any new New Jersey employees have to live in New Jersey, which I understand why, but it's a catch-22 for a resident of New Jersey that's also an employee of New Jersey. But which one's worse? Well, the, the leave bank that whatever your husband has, he gets, right? Whatever he has, he's going to get. It, it, I, I can say yes because I know. It's going forward. So if he has nine months, he gets whatever the value is in the nine months. Uh, and I only can say because I'm doing what I've done the legislation and I know what it is. You can't take away, you can't take away something that's already been earned. Okay? Now as far as the pensions, if you'll bear me a minute, because this takes a little bit of time to explain. And you know, I'm a labor guy, so I get people really upset when I say this. 
teachers, and public employees went along with the bonding of the pensions in the 90s. That was criminal. Shouldn't have done. In trade, in trade, in trade, this is not hard to figure out. Instead of paying five and a half, they got to reduce the contribution to three and a half. Then they lowered the retirement age by five years. Then they increased the value of the pension by 9% without one penny going in. Oh, well, we're broke. How could that have happened? With, even with the government not spending, even with the government not spending, there's a thing called an assumption on pensions. It's the rate that you assume that your pension is going to make. It's called an assumption rate. The assumption rate is eight and a quarter on the pensions, which is extremely high. In the private sector, it's seven and a half. There's discussions to even reduce that, that focus. So over the last decade, they made 2%, not eight and, a, eight and a quarter. So every year, we were short six and a quarter percent. So you lowered the contribution for several years. You lowered the retirement age by five years. You increased the value of the pension by 9%, and your investments didn't make they were supposed to be. We're broke. They said, and the state did not put anything in. I, I, I agree. All those things combined but cause this problem. But the biggest problem is even if the state had put their money in, you're still bleeding money. Because pensions are very simple. You want more, you pay more. And when you say, why well, negotiate five and a half percent and that's all I'm going to put in? Well, that's great. That's not how it works in the real world. Because when the markets don't function right, you know, when they did the bonding of the pension, they said the stock market would never go down for 30 years. You know, that was a, serious. That was the explanation for that. That the market was going to grow like it was growing in the 90s for the next 30 years. That's why they could do all these things they did. So I understand what, you know, what you're saying. We you kept the pensions solid. They were two years away from being bankrupt. Now, you know what happens when the pension goes bankrupt? Have any idea? They cut the benefit of the pension down by a lot because they don't have the money to pay. What I did accomplish in this bill, and I'm proud of what I did and Fred and my colleagues, is we mandated in the legislation that he has to make a pension payment. And he's making the pension payment. And in 30 years, that pension will be solved because there's 800,000 people relying on that pension. And we have an obligation to by the workers that have worked with that. Listen, I will never categorize a state worker as greedy, because they're not. They're not wealthy, they don't make a lot of money, but the problem was they were misled by leadership. Think about it, how do you all of a sudden you get, I can retire five years sooner, and guess what, it didn't cost anything. How, how's that happen, how's that just appear? No one asked the question, how are we doing this? When it went up 9% in value, all of a sudden your pension, your husband's got a pension that's worth 9% more than what he's paying for it. How did that happen? No one asked the question because, look, you know, union officials are no different than elected officials. They get elected to office. How nice is it to go back to your members and say, look what I got you. Isn't this great? I got you all these benefits. And honestly, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a combination of groups working collaboratively, and the workers were at risk, and the workers were very close to losing their pensions. You know, and honestly, I can go to sleep every night and I'm like the right thing. I protected the pensions of 800,000 people, and I'm proud of that. And again, everyone would argue over the pensions. Well, it's not fixing it today. Guess what? It's not going to fix it today. It takes 30 years, and if you don't look 30 years out, when you're doing pension calculations, because that's what actuaries do, that's why he said we're gonna save $120 billion. We fixed the pension, we were fair with people, and people have to make a decision on how much they want. Because I wouldn't regard as a worker, how much you want, just gotta pay for it. We'll put it, we're there, I'm happy, people work hard for a living. But you have to put the money in to get the money out. Really, that's as simple as it, people have 401ks, you know, if you have a 401k, you only can take so much out because you put so much in. But government's responsible. Believe me, I'm not washing their hands. But there's a whole bunch of players to be blamed 
for what happened. There's nothing free in this world. And anybody that thinks there is is foolish. There is nothing free. You play with pensions, you're playing with fire, you're playing with people's retirements, and it's tragic what happened to these people. It is really tragic because the workers that work, as you said, they took jobs, not big paying jobs, but they took jobs for the security of the pension and health benefits and retirement. The problem is we're paying so much in taxes now, it's, it's harder to do. Healthcare plans are averaging over $20,000 of planning. That's not the workers' fault, and that's not my fault. You know, we got to figure out a way to fix health insurance. But, but a lot that, of people think they need to get free health insurance. No, 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 listen, and you'll never hear me criticize a state worker honestly. And I, I get frustrated with the leadership because in, in, in my union, I can't stand up there and tell them the sun's shining when it's raining. I got to tell them the truth. You know, there's nothing for it. There's no free rise here. Ma'am? Yes? Yes, uh, my son uh, went to the protests uh, recently occupying. And uh, a man talked to him and told him there was a huge increase in the prison population in the United States. And uh, there were reports that this prison system has been privatized and huge amounts of money are going to rich people at the top of these uh, private companies running the prisons. And uh, I've seen a huge increase in my property taxes. I don't know whether we're talking about federal prisons or state prisons. I look on Amazon, I see books written about America's perpetual prison machine and huge amounts of tax money, whether it's federal or state, I don't know. But I do know my property taxes have gone, have doubled since I moved in. And uh, the prisoners are never helped. They're put in prison for petty, heavy charges and not helped with getting off drugs or whatever and then put in again and taken advantage of and oftentimes they don't seem to have access to legal help. And I want to know are these prisons we're talking and again people at the top, rich people are making lots of money off a so-called privatized privatization, which is really not a competitive system at all. So what I want to know is um, this type of thing, is this uh, only on the federal level? Does this affect the state? And what is the state of New Jersey doing about it? Well, unfortunately, there's privatization of federal prisons or state prisons, functions of state prisons being privatized. And I, I just don't believe in privatization. I never did. Because the only savings in privatization comes from taking health care and pensions away from people. So I don't support that at all, and I never have. And I have a 14-year history in Gloucester County of not privatizing one job. So, you know, I mean, I don't believe in it, but it is taking place. Now, on a positive front, the governor talked about a program that we agree with, which is getting nonviolent drug offenders out of jail and getting them the treatment they need to hopefully keep them out of jail and make them productive citizens. You know, we have works our jails are full of people that aren't violent, they have problems. And it's cheaper to try to get them to treatment centers than it is to keep them house locked up because we're not benefiting from that. You know, so we are looking at that. That's something that was well received by everyone when the governor announced that. But you know, the privatization part, privatization, and I'm just gonna tell you, I never see it as a good thing. Because I see people that are people that go to work every day are gonna go work with the same job, which is not gonna have benefits. So, you know, I mean, so we're in the same place now. But they are people that get very wealthy. Because that's where all the savings go. You know, you need so many people in the jails. So all the savings comes from the benefits of paying people less. And this is an expensive state to live in, so I, I'm concerned about it. Yes, ma'am. Oh. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Hoffman. I'm a state because I'm worried about their education. I'm sorry. In the past two years, I have seen the education system in this state politicized. It makes me sick to my stomach. Now, Cherry Hill has a charter school that just came into our area. It shouldn't have come into our area. And I have been fighting it for the last six months, but I can't seem to get the DOE's attention in regards to it. 
I made phone calls to the governor, as a matter of fact. I made a phone call to the Ask the Governor program at New Jersey 101.5 in November and asked the governor about this and why he allowed this to happen. I wrote letters to the DOE asking them not to allow this school to come into our area. I asked them not to approve it. We have a ex-offender program being run in the same location as the school will be run. Now, there are two bills out there. One is a local control bill, S458, and there is also a transparency bill, S408. Why haven't they come onto the Senate's floor for those? I don't even know where they're at in the committee, to be honest with you right now, but your issue, I'm very well aware of. I don't represent Cherry Hill Center Beach does, and we have gotten the administration's attention. You know, there's been, there was a petition originally signed, passed around. I actually, have, I'm sorry. I actually have another petition asking for the DOE not to grant final approval. Well, we're working on that because the petition talks about a charter school in the Brunswick area. Not even the Cherry Hill area, the Brunswick area. We are very focused on this issue in Cherry Hill because we don't think charter schools really belong everywhere. You know, the charter school where you have successful school districts has taken resources from that successful school district. So as far as the bills, I'd have to look them up to find out where. And again, I got people here. We could talk to you and get back to you on that. But understand that Senator Beach and I have had meetings with the Commissioner Sir, and we've had these discussions with the governor's office over this issue. So it's not falling on deaf ears. We are absolutely uh, paying attention to it. Well, the issues anytime soon. We happen to know that there may be another charter school coming in for approval in Cherry Hill, well, along with this first one that was approved. And it's going to continue on until these bills actually get onto the Senate floor and get voted on. Again, I have to look at them. I can't, I can't in good conscience tell you uh, why or why the bills haven't been up yet. Honestly, we're focused on a lot of education reform right now. We're talking about tenure reform. We've been working on that. We're trying to find ways to improve quality of schools. So what I'm telling you is that issue, I can tell you, is being very well addressed with us right now. The Cherry Hill piece, and then we got to look at the bills to make sure the charter schools go where they belong, not places where they don't. Well, what about the transparency bill? The tra uh, these charter schools do not have to follow the same rules that the regular public schools do, and I, that's not fair. I agree, but again, I don't have the bill, I, I don't have the knowledge of the bill on top of my head give me an answer, but I will give you one as soon as I, as soon as Kevin's here, we'll give you his card, we'll follow back up with you, and like I said, I'd rather give you an informed answer than try to guess at something and I can get an honest answer. Fair enough. All right, thank you. Thank you. You're, you're, you're a man after my own heart. You know, 
on a small scale. In Gloucester County, again, when I was a freeholder, we merged two school districts. But we controlled the special services and vocational school. We net savings 1.5 million a year, every year. So we said, you know, there was there was a bill kicking around in the legislature talking about a demonstration project for a countywide school district. And because Gloucester County does so many shared services, they said it's going to Gloucester County. I went, Fred, remember? We went to a meeting at Cherry at, at, at Washington Township. Thirty. 500 people showed up. And because we were talking about trying to find a ways to shrink that administrative cost, put the money back into government, back into schools, and cut taxes, which you can do, we had our heads ripped off. And there was organizations that actually videoed this. This was a this was the ugliest meeting I've ever been in. I've been in a lot of other ones. And they sent it to every legislator in the state saying, if you even think about doing this, this is what's going to happen. See, I'm a believer, is what you just said, we collect more than enough money in taxes. More than enough. And it's not just being made up. And we can provide better services and cut taxes. But when you have 600 school districts and 566 municipalities, you're going to have all this duplication of costs. I'm going to tell you a really, a really neat story. In my county, whatever, county I live in, the mayor had the nerve to say, let's do away with the police department. The chief's retiring. And if anybody knows Winona, it's a beautiful little town. That's one square mile, or maybe two. It's gorgeous. And you can save $400 per household. That's a good thing. They got the highest taxes in Gloucester County on average. So the mayor thought he was doing something good. You know, that's what he's elected to do, right? They, if you drove through the town, on every law was save our police department. So we know property taxes are the issue, but then when we went to Winona, they didn't want to do it. Right? They voted it down two to one. So the state is so financially messed up. We keep trying to spread this aid, this municipal aid to these towns that aren't willing to take care of things that themselves. Like you said at home, you're making tough decisions at home. So basically, I said, enough of being a nice guy. You don't want to save on your own? Guess what? We're going to cut your aid. Then you can have the expensive government that you have, and I can't say a thing about it because I'm not giving you any money towards it. That's fair, right? Well, guess what? you got to hear the mayor scream. That's so unfair. We don't have the money to give, and we should give money to places that are willing to start at home. You know, they say charity starts at home. You start making tough decisions at home before you, you know, before you go to somewhere else. And I'm telling you, we collect way more money. Another service we provide is EMS. Only county in the state has countywide EMS. EMS is in crisis in the state. Our response times are average five minutes and 50 seconds. The national standard for excellence is around nine minutes, eight minutes and 59 seconds, 90% of the time. We're faster. Everyone on the rig is trained and certified. No one's one that doesn't know. And we said to the towns, look, we're going to do it. We're just going to give it to you. We're going to build it to the county tax rates, one penny. Then you don't ever have to pay for another drop of gas, insurance, ambulances, anything. Four years into it, we only have 16 of the towns. So you know what I'm saying? It's like, we got to get real with this stuff. And being nice guys don't work anymore. So we're getting tough with it. And I intend to get very tough with them because we have to we have to start getting serious about shrinking government. Because I'm, I'm telling you, when we save money at the two school districts I talked to you about, we now have the lowest administrative costs in both categories in the state. We improved education and we reduced the cost. And you can do that all throughout the state. I have time for one one more of this gentleman in the back in the sweatshirt. Because we, we promised we would keep it about an hour because of the national championship games on tonight. And I don't want to deny anybody. I don't want to be blamed for anybody missing any of them. Yes, sir. My name is Dave Walker. I got a question for you. Uh, the plan sounds really good, but I'm a little naive. So I guess it's a two part question. One, what is it going to take to get this plan in place? But I guess the real magic question is you can give me 10% back the rest of my life, but the rate 
property taxes keep going up, for every hundred, you're gonna be $10 back. So it's really, I'm not saving anything or getting any real money back. How do we stabilize taxes? Well, I just started, I just said that earlier, Dave, and I feel for him, look at your fingers, I'm an iron worker. Hopefully your hand's gonna be okay. <laughs> not really, I lost a little bit. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know, I'm sorry to see that. And I, I know you had, had a little issue there. But, you know, we can stabilize property taxes. But it has to be a decision that you can't care about the name on the truck anymore. It, it doesn't matter as long as it shows up. As long as it shows up and picks up the trash, as long as it shows up, the ambulance shows up, as long as the police officer shows up when he needs them. That's what is important. And that's how you can control costs. I'm telling you, there are millions and millions of dollars being wasted. When we talk about the countywide school system in Gloucester County, I think the administrative dollars are spent in Gloucester County roughly $68 million. Cut it in half. $34 million. You could do that. You know, and we never were talking about one school district. We were talking about like eight. You know, you have regional school districts, right? There's regional. In Gloucester, it's Delcy, Kingsway, Clearview, and Gateway. They all have elementary schools underneath them. All have superintendents. All the board secretaries all have all this. And then they go up to the high school where your kids are getting ready to go to college. You don't need all that administrative. You don't need all that administration. But you know, it's it's finally people are getting to the point we keep talking about this, and people are finally realizing that you know there are the ways you squeeze the dollars. I told somebody, you know, I should have made the property tax zero. I should have made it zero. Because that's how people are living right now. With no raises, we said do 2%. When in hindsight, it should have been zero for one reason. More towns are starting to share now because they have to. But what's really upsetting is when you hear about a town that partners up. It's not upsetting, it's positive, but it's upsetting because they'll, they'll partner up with another town to collect trash, and both towns can save 150, 180,000. Well, why did I have to put a cap in place for you to do that? You know what I mean? Like, if you could save that money, why didn't you do it in the beginning? Sure. Yes. Uh, sure. Is it, isn't there a backdoor to that 2% cap? There's an exception There's with something. health insurance for municipal workers? Yeah, it's not a backdoor, it's, it's a fact that we provide, the state of New Jersey gives towns the pension bill and the health care bill. And until we figure out a way to control the increases in that, if I'm not controlling it at 2%, how do I give you a bill saying control it to? I mean, that, that was the discussion. Once we do a better job of providing a level of cost to the local government, once we do that, then you can put that under a cap too. But understand, we've done pension benefit reform, we did interest arbitration reform, we did property tax cap, and shared services is high on my priority. And I honestly believe shared services will bring dollars in. And I'm telling you, when you take two towns, they decide to share trash collection, and they save $150,000, $170,000. Think about it, that's something they could have been doing all along. You know what I mean? And this isn't really creative stuff. This is New Jersey being an old state. Home rule was the thing people said you could never do away with. Well, people are at a breaking point in the state. You know, the average property tax bill is 7,500. So what's that? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, how about how much you have to earn? You know what I mean? That's, that's $7,500 after taxes. How much you have to earn to pay your property tax bill? So that's the big issue, is finding ways to control costs, to control the size of government. And it's, you know, in New Jersey, it's actually pretty easy. Because there's just so much of it. You know, it's low hanging fruit. You can consolidate governments all over the place and come up with real dollars, millions and millions of dollars. And then at least you get to the true cost of government. Now, I'm a big history fan, and on the History Channel, they showed Henry Ford created the manufacturing. And then along came the Japanese and the Japanese government, you know, they basically kicked our butts on manufacturing. But the way they did it is, if they had 100 people in the manufacturing line building a car, after three months they would pull 10 away. They still build the same number of cars, the same quality of cars, and after a while they pull another 10 of what? The 
until they found the true cost of providing the service and keeping the quality. We don't know what the true cost is. And you'll hear local government, you'll hear local governments say, well, it's only pennies. Well, they're my pennies. The pennies add up to dollars. So I mean, I don't mind providing a, a decent, decent salary benefits for my workers, but why should I have to pay more than I need to? So I'm telling you, we're going to be pushing very hard on shared services. Because in Gloucester County, on average, towns in Gloucester County save 18 cents on their tax rate. You hear about towns going up 3 cents, 5 cents, 6 cents. 18 cents on the tax rate, which averages $275 for every, on average, for the entire county, for little things like police dispatch. 911, and you can go beyond counties, you can go beyond borders. So, you know, these are things that, it's just not town to town. Counties can consolidate services. Counties can eliminate and consolidate services to save money too. That's what I'm saying, when you start looking at this, you say, well, the service still happens, but I'm paying less for it, but the same people are still doing it too. You know, so, we, we have a lot of effort to do, but we're getting there. I'm gonna ask my audience this last one, and then I gotta roll. Um, one, one suggestion that I have um, for, for the state is to get a few um, people who are experts in Six Sigma. I'm a black belt in Six Sigma. And um, I think most governments, including the federal government, the state government, and the county governments, could use some of those expertise. I'm retired now. My last, my last thing is I'm going to be um, unselfish. Um, most people in this room are probably from uh, more affluent areas. I had the fortune um, of living in Borges, owning property in Borges, now I do live in Blackwood. But I wonder what we're doing about people who live in um, places like Linden Wall and some of the, um, some of the areas where you have more, um, more people who are indigent and can't afford um, even what we're talking about here. What are we doing for, um, for some of those people? Providing the service as best we can with the government we have as far as what we're doing, but we're, we're making sure that they get a break here under the governor's plan to get the 80 bucks. You know, we're trying to find ways to help them, but again, I'd have to talk more in detail with you on what you're looking for, and I could give you more specific answers. We do a lot of things. We do a whole lot of things. You don't have to tell me what your real hair, you know, what, what the areas are. Is it health care? There is family care. We have different programs. But I need to know more specifically. And again, I have staff here. Kevin would be happy to talk to you after we're done. But listen, I want to thank everyone for coming thank out you. and giving me a chance to hear your issues. Thank you.